evening we have Glenn Boga, trustee, Jay Grover, trustee, Sherry Steffens, trustee, Jude Kuhn, our district clerk, Dr. Brian Graham, superintendent, I'm Ashley Dreyer, president, Sue Marston, vice president, Joy Lamarca, trustee, Danielle Bruno, trustee, Michael Loria, assistant superintendent of curriculum, staff development, and human resources, Cheryl Cardone, assistant superintendent of pupil personnel services, and Dr. Robert Merkel, Assistant Superintendent for School Business and Finance. Just a couple of announcements. If you could silence your cell phone, please, that would be greatly appreciated. There's emergency exits directly behind me and directly in front of me in case we need to leave unexpectedly. And if I could have a motion to approve the agenda for uh, this evening, March 25th, please. And a second? second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 7 0. Um, if I could have a motion to approve the minutes from March 11th, please. And a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 7 0. Um, we have a couple, we have student ambassadors with us, well, just one student ambassador from the high school with us this evening. Um, if we could have an introduction, please. No? Yep, come on up. Good evening, my name is Zaina Basudi and I'm a senior here at the high school. I would like to share some of the highlights of what has been happening at our school. Recently, spring sports have gone underway. This is the first year the high school has offered a girls flag football team, and they recently took a trip to the Buffalo Bills field house where the actual Bills team practices for their games. While there, they competed in scrimmages against other schools. This was a really co cool opportunity for them. This upcoming Thursday, we have the annual volleyball tournament. The winners of each gym class will be competing against each other for a spot in the championship against the faculty and staff team, uh, which is a nice way to end the week. Over the break, the French students are traveling to France and Belgium to immerse themselves in the culture, and we can't wait to hear their stories upon their return. This past week consisted of our annual Clash of the Vikings competition. The week started off with Blue and White Day to show off some school spirit and a pie eating contest in each lunch period. Tuesday consisted of Jersey Shore and Jersey Day with a Guess That Milk competition during lunches. Red, White, and Blue was worn on Wednesday and a trivia competition was held. Thursday was Roll Out of Bed Day and during lunches we collected <laughs> donations uh, of clothing <laughs> items. <laughs> happen every day. Pretty much. Yep. Day. <laughs> a lot of people participated in that one. <laughs> um, the competition of that day was folding that laundry and finally on Friday it was class color day with minute to minute games during lunches. Student council did an amazing job facilitating this opportunity for the students to come together and have fun. The clash competition was a hit with many students coming, whether that be to cheer for their fellow teammates or just to participate. The seniors won with the juniors coming in second, the sophomores third, and the freshmen last. This friendly competition was a great way to fundraise money and unite the students. Lastly, on March 20th, I received the Youth of the Year Award through the National Exchange Club. This award is based on academic, extracurricular, and volunteer accolades. I was awarded with a $500 scholarship, and myself and a student from Starpoint were honored at a breakfast in which each of our guidance counselors made a speech vouching for our character and achievements. We then also had to make a speech answering the question, 
How has the increasing emphasis on diversity and inclusion impacted American youth? With this information, the committee will choose one person to continue on to the next level of com competition, which takes place in Penn State. Congratulations. Oh, wow. <laughs> Congratulations. We're very, very proud. Thank you so much. Team. We have the unified bowling team here. Come on up. And our coach. Melissa, could you give us a little intro and talk sure. about the season? Sure. We had a great season. We always do. Um, I brought a couple of them with me. This is Savannah Bukowski. Um, this is Fiona Joss, Tessa DeMartin, and my buddy down there, Kate Luciano. Um, we had a great season. They had a lot of fun. I'm going to let them talk too. Um, this is our fifth year in Unified Bowling. We have basketball well underway. Um, play hard. It gives them an opportunity. They're great bowlers. They're now professional bowlers, which is great. Um, but I'm going to let them talk a little bit about what their favorite, their favorite thing is. What's your favorite thing about Unified Bowling? What's your favorite thing about Unified Bowling? Having fun with friends. Yeah. Hanging out with friends, right? Yeah. Fiona, what about you as a senior graduating, mm. participating? This was my first year doing unified sports. Um, I've gone to like all of their games the last couple of years, but it was awesome to be able to participate in this side of the community. It's awesome. I spent a lot of time in the life skills classroom anyway, so I might as well extend it. <laughs> so it was a great time. Um, I'm awful at bowling, but. They were super, super nice. She to almost me. got kicked off a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Tessa. Favorite part about another senior? Um, probably just seeing the friendships that they make. Throughout the years, they make friends that they wouldn't have met otherwise. Yeah. 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 What's that? What's on your bowling ball, though? His favorite. His favorite um, Marvel character is Hulk, so he has a Hulk bowling ball, which is pretty cool, right? Right. Yeah. It's, it's a big green thing that rolls it down and he launches it. It's <laughs> Just well, a little bit. Yes. Unless I see Savannah's holding something. Yes. So this year we were able to get um, third place um, in um, our section. Um, we participate in a culminating activity at the end of the season, which is held at Airport Lanes, Chichawaga. And there's roughly, I believe there's about 56 teams um, across uh, Western New York that participate in unified sports in bowling. And we were able to get uh, third place in Section 6. So, that's a Thank you. Thank you. Savannah, I'd like to have you come to the microphone if you'd be so kind. Savannah, I believe you and some of your uh, high school peers, Elijah and Haley, uh, won Athlete of the Year through the Niagara Athletic Panel, or the Niagara Panel League. Can you just tell the Board of Education what that night, night was like? Uh, I believe there was a dinner and a special ceremony. There was a dinner, and it was nice. Everybody was nice, and I had my coach with me. That's great. <laughs> yeah. What did you get from there? Get a bowling and basketball award. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Congratulations. Very special event. Nice for you to be there with your peers and being honored as an athlete in our school district. So congratulations. Thank you. Great. Well done. We're going to take a few pictures here. Thank you.
Any parents that are here want to take a picture? Great. like to recognize Kaylee Farkas, a uh, Veronica Connor Middle School 7th grader who has made the USA 12U All-American Northeast Region 1 team for softball. And um, she is, as a 7th grader, I guess we would say killing it <laughs> in softball. Awesome. Can, um, yeah, we have Kaylee come up. Kaylee. Yeah, tell us a little bit about your journey. Your it mom and dad can come out too. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so Kaylee, I understand seventh grader. Yeah. Right? And this is a, a wonderful honor. Just tell us a little bit about it. How how is it that you have been identified as a future all star in the sport and yeah. how did you get connected to this? Um so my the my friends that I play with that are older than me. So I kind of like got the idea from them and my coaches. So you basically like try out for a team and there's like a hundred kids at the tryout and they pick 15 I think. And you basically like do all of like, like hitting and all that. And then you go up and the coaches select 15 of you and then you're from one region. So like, you kind of play a bunch of different reasons at the Oklahoma College, and like a different college coach comes every year. So last year, I think the Oklahoma coach came, and it was pretty cool. Sounds mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I got people whispering in my ear. Kaylee, what, what is your favorite position in the field, and oh. have you also tried out for our varsity team? I'm trying out for the Russians. Jamie. Yes, Jamie. Yeah. I'm playing Jamie this year. Congratulations. And thank you. And then I think my favorite position is either short or pitcher. Oh, short sure. or pitcher. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Do you know anybody on the board? Do you have any uh, connections with anybody? <laughs> 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 uh, the Board of Education. My Aunt Joy. My Aunt Joy. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Very good. Aunt Joy, Aunt Joy. Aunt Joy, do you have anything to add? Just that we're really proud of you and we're super excited for <laughs> you to play out in Oklahoma in August. So. She's been working really hard and I can't remember what age Angel did she start? She was young. She probably five, four, yeah, five. Yeah, that she started playing softball. So to be recognized as one of how many in the Northeast? So 15 in the entire Northeast. Yeah. And yeah, out of all the girls playing softball. So only three hundred and sixty girls have selected for playing the country. Wow, that's amazing. It's a pretty league. Yeah. So we're very proud of her. Yeah. 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 Mr. Meany was very excited. Send me a text. Is it okay if we get a group picture with the board? Sure. Thank you.
we did not have anyone sign up for the public comment session agenda items only. So that brings us to curriculum and instruction with Mr. Loria. Thank you and good evening everyone. Um, just have three informational presentations on the briefer side tonight. Um, so we're going to go just a little out of order. I'm going to start with our Recruit Academy presentation with Harvey Ali. Board of Education and District Administrators, thank you for allowing us to share information with you about a pilot project that our high school team has been working on, um, which we're hoping to implement in the coming year. We are calling it our Blue Crew Academy. So the origin of this project was really in relation to a variety of gaps that our teachers have been observing over the past couple of years. We've been engaging in a lot of conversation even right before COVID had began. Um, and we noticed some areas that our students really could use some additional development on to help them be more successful as students in our high school. Some of these areas include study skills, time management, stress management, um, information about life <coughs> after high school, test taking skills, some general soft skills as well. And this past fall, uh, we engaged in a lot more discussion about it, and we surveyed parents and found essentially parents are seeing the exact same things and sharing the exact same concerns with us as well. When we then went ahead and surveyed our students, because we wanted to make sure we got some voice from everybody involved, we found that they essentially were sharing the exact same observations and concerns about areas that they felt they needed. Um, Initially, we began this conversation as a goal to develop something specifically for freshmen, but what we found was notably our upperclassmen shared a lot of concerns about what they feel their needs are as well, so it kind of evolved into something a little bit bigger over time. Uh, we have a lot of students who are enrolled in our AP program and just upperclassmen in general doing advanced coursework that said, I also am in need of study skills and test-taking strategies and how do I manage stress. It really wasn't isolated to just that transitional school year. Um, so as we went through and kind of began developing our ideas about the program, we had some conversation with our advisory council um, that Dr. Graham was involved with as well. Uh, we had a lot of discussion about what they might be interested in, what this might look like, and our team of teachers, adults, decided to develop a pilot program that we would ultimately like to implement in the coming fall. So we had about, it was a decent amount, we had about 80 to 90 students who responded to the survey and then we have about another 20-ish students who are involved in our uh, advisory council. So we had a fair <laughs> number of students who responded. Again, a lot of them were our upper uh, classmen that responded. We had a handful of freshmen, but a lot of them were the upper classmen and many of them were in our advanced programs. Yeah. So using this information, we worked with a team of 17 teachers this year, as well as Jamie and I, to kind of work together over the past six months. We met about every other week after school. We also built out a few full days of work together to really develop and conceptualize what should this look like. Um, we identified the topics that we want to cover in the first year. We also have started some work on the materials and activities we would like to include. I'm really, really proud of the work that we have done and just the number of people involved. We actually had about another 10 teachers who wanted to be involved and just couldn't build the time into their after school schedule, the child care and so forth. Um, but I'm going to turn it over. This is really a teacher driven project working with our kids. So I'm going to turn it over to one of our special ed teachers, Kelly Marcus, and our English teacher, Amelia, so they can tell you just a little bit more about our goals, the planning, and the process that we're kind of embedding into our program for next year. Thanks, Mary. How do I do this? I just click? No. Oh, wrong way. Okay. <laughs> Technology is not my thing. Um, okay, so the purpose, um, Hillary talked a little bit more about that too, but it's again creating an opportunity for all students to develop a strong relationship with an adult in the building. Um, I know that we have some kids that have already developed strong relationships with our faculty, but this would literally encompass all students so that everyone would have someone to feel like they could go to 
um, for a variety of reasons. Um, it would also create an opportunity for small group um, student interactions that are not academic content specific to foster student to student relationship building. Um, groups would be heterogeneously picked, so it would be a, a mixture of, of our advanced placement students and um, life skills life kids students, um, life skills students, um, regions track students. All all sorts of people would be in one group at one time, which is really um, kind of a neat concept. And we're going to create an opportunity to address soft skill and information gaps that we see with our students in a consistent and recurring manner. Uh, I know Amelia Shinto will be talking about that a little bit. And providing opportunities to address college and career readiness skills um, on a consistent and recurring basis also, which is something that identi they identified um, as a need. So our goal is to have this once per month in the school year, with the exception of June, which is just too hairy with regents exams. Um, and we're hoping to meet at <laughs> grade level <laughs> with, uh, sorry, there we go. There it is. Okay. Uh, with two teacher blue crew leaders. So we're hoping also to create teams of teachers who wouldn't necessarily work together all the time. Um, so I would love, you know, I'm an English teacher, I'd love if I were paired with a math teacher or an art teacher. I would love to have um, a new person and a new dynamic to work with that the students hadn't seen before. Uh, so it's about a one hour grade level appropriate seminar, so we're going to have the same student schedule every month. Um, it's going to run on an assembly schedule, so it won't be cutting out, you know, third period or something like that. All of the classes will be shortened and it will add up to approximately 60 minutes of uh, missed time per class for the high school. So um, in September, we're hoping to do some team building. We're also gonna do uh, intro to school basics, uh, how, how you get around where everything is for the freshmen, but also reintroducing things like accessing your grades in the parent portal, things that we still see students having trouble with, um, and getting into the basic Google functions that the kids need to uh, access. October, we're really going to be focusing on study skills because we find that curriculum is rolled out more so by then and kids start having tests and having papers due um, and being able to manage their time and create a study space. I feel like uh, we all str struggle to find a place to concentrate and so I think that's something that we're going to focus on with these students. November, we're going to be talking about resilience, um, and that's going to go along with our guest speaker that is coming in November, and that's going to be the theme of our guest speaker coming. Uh, December is stress management. January is goal setting, so kind of like a new year, new goals, new you. It's also when our underclassmen would be scheduling, so they'd be thinking about what they want their next year to look like, whereas our seniors would be plotting what do they want the next year of their lives to look like. So um, we're going to try to vary how we approach this with the different grade levels uh, in a way that's appropriate for seniors as opposed to freshmen, et cetera. February, we're going to be talking about building relationships and communication. I know that we all have seen um, students struggle with how to communicate, especially with adults, uh, by email, um, how to approach someone. So we're going to be talking about the soft skills there. March, we're going to be discussing digital citizenship, which, as you know, is a lifelong issue that we all um, cope with and our students struggle with. Growth mindset is going to be our strategy for April. Um, how do you move on to be something greater in the following year? May, we're going to wrap up end of year celebration. Hopefully, it'll be a nice day out. We can do some outdoor activities. Um, we're looking forward to that. So our goal is to have the freshman crews be smaller. We really see the problem um, has grown out of, this has grown out of the needs of our freshmen to be able to transition into the high school. So we're hoping to create smaller groups for the freshmen, whereas the upperclassmen would have more of a regular class size um, approach. We're gonna have guest speakers come for college and trades, military for the seniors. We know some of these topics won't be necessarily super appropriate for seniors, and so we're building out things that are more appropriate and more needed for our seniors to move on from high school, especially the second half of the year. Uh, and uh, the BCA development team will be conducting regular feedback surveys as we go. We do acknowledge that this is a 
pilot program and we're interested in finding out how this is working for the students and how it's working for the faculty as well. All right, so some short-term goals. Um, we're hoping that students will feel connected, more connected with teachers and other students. Um, we're hoping to build smaller communities and smaller connections. Students will improve communication skills and habits. Students will improve academic skills and habits and develop universal skill sets that they have been lacking. Um, and then we're hoping that faculty members will have more opportunity to collaborate on common skills across content. So that way we can address, you know, we can say, okay, we know that you went over how to communicate in our February Blue Crew community. Please write an email to your faculty member if you need an extension. If you, if you write me because you need an assignment extension, remember what we went over. Here's how you write to an adult in an adult manner. So we're hoping that the skills transfer across and that all teachers are aware of exactly what skills every student has. For some of our long-term goals, um, we're talking again about the increased opportunity for number of student-teacher connections. Like we've said a couple times already, that every student will have at least one adult to, that they feel comfortable with. And really, if our crews have two adults, which right now we think is feasible, um, that's two adults that they can go to for um, a variety of things throughout the year, not just on Blue Crew Academy days. Um, intrinsic motivation for students to challenge themselves and take academic risks. Improved attendance rates, desire to attend school. We all know that people want to be where they feel wanted and we're hoping that this really connects with a lot of our students. Um, and that will then in turn improve some attendance rates too. Again, positive school climate and culture and improved graduation rates for all at-risk students. So we are asking for the support of the board in order to be able to implement and sustain this program for students. Our goal is to continue to evolve this program as Kelly and Amelia shared. We do plan on running this first year as a pilot to gather a lot of data. We're going to be conducting surveys with our students, we'll be conducting surveys with our parents and with our teachers so we can continue to develop this into what makes the most sense for our <laughs> students. Uh, and to make sure that we are differentiating topics based on each grade level's different varying needs as what already was discussed. Um, in order for this to be well managed and sustainable, we are seeking a coordinator position stipend. This would allow for a point person to be able to develop the surveys and to be able to gather that data and help us use that data, as well as the continued development of the curriculum. We have a handful of topics that we would like to cover this coming year. Those will need to continue to shift and evolve and change in time. Um, and we're also seeking some additional funds to help with materials and supplies, some of the basics like folders that we need to be able to put um, lessons and materials in for our students. But in addition, we also are hoping that we can incentivize with monthly challenges that our students want to use the skills that we are teaching them. Um, and lastly, we're also seeking some assistance just with the lesson development and the materials and activities that will need to continue to be conducted over the summer in order to ensure that we're able to pull this program off next school year. So thank you so much for allowing us to share this information with you tonight. We'd be happy to field any questions if you have them. questions but I just did want to comment that I love it I think it's great and I love that it's feedback based right you're reaching out to the kids to see what what their needs are and you know to hear that they're asking for things that we take for granted like study skills and, 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 and just simple things like writing down assignments and using planners and admitting they need help with that is it's it's great that they're, they're willing to share that and that we're trying to provide them with uh, you know support in, in helping them and guiding them so Thank you. So, just one quick question. Sorry, I, I love it myself. I love that we were able to actually have 90 students respond, right, and respond that they did need help and things that they were having trouble with, right. We don't usually get responses like that, so that's excellent that they were able to, to reach out like that. My question is, we were, we have a one-hour free that that that's seven hour. There will be any work inside classrooms. Um, just to follow up if we find, I know it's a, a pilot program, but if we find that they need more than that one hour or whatever that seminar is, we'll, we might look to 
deodoration in the classrooms or um, yeah, that's the intention. So the fact that all of our students will experience the same topic every month, even though it will be differentiated based on grade level, right? It will allow our teachers to all be able to share the common language, the common expectations that we're discussing, and there will be commonalities for all students. Also, that goal of having a monthly challenge, the kids will be reminded by their teachers, remember that we, we address this topic, here's your goal, and, how, and, and I think incentivizing it will help too. But to Jane's point, our students are asking for this, right? When they're telling us, hey, I am in an AP class, but I still am not quite sure how to study, and I really would like to learn how to manage my stress or manage my time. Um, I think that in and of itself is really great for us to hear because it, it's telling us our kids want this and, and they really desire it. Right, I just was wondering where. Yep, there we will continue to infuse it in the classroom. Our teachers will continue those conversations throughout the month specific to that topic. And I'm sure it will um, cycle back throughout the year too because every teacher will have experienced these conversations with our kids. That's great, thank you. I love the topics too. Congratulations and just this is a tremendous you know, work that the teachers have done after school and I hope it does continue in the summer. I definitely am supportive of it and I love the topics that the students have brought to you and that you're implementing and I think it's great when students are working on you know, study skills, goal setting and all things that they need, real life skills that they they need to have for you know college or beyond you know, in high school. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Cuts Harvey, Mrs. Marcus, Mrs. Shinta. Um, we're going to have our next presentation by Mrs. Sensenbrook, who is our coordinator over at Eco Island, and she's going to share some of the awesome things going on over there and some of the um, use and how it's been used this past year. Thanks. Yes. Thank you so much for taking, uh, giving me the opportunity to share what's going on over at Eco Island. And as uh, Mike was mentioning before, I'm the coordinator of Eco Island. Um, I took on that role after I retired in June of 2022, and it's a great retirement job. I love it. I really do. So what I wanted to do tonight was just give you a little glimpse. Um, most of the time, I, I do have some pictures here, but most of the time I'm right in the middle of things, you know, like working on a center, working with kids, and then the, the kids will leave, and I was like, I didn't take any pictures, you know, so. But anyway, um, Here's an example of um, the first grades, uh, and also there's a third grade picture in there too. Uh, we were learning about the fall and how the leaves change color and what is the science behind that, about how the chlorophyll in the leaves actually uh, dissipates. It goes back into the tree and stores it in there in the winter time. And so th there's a little bit more than just an art project, but yet it's nice to have some pieces for the children to take home and then they can see like on the little label on the corner of those pictures that they made that they created it'll say what the colors are and what the name of the chemical is that's in the leaf that is underneath the leaf um, and it's there the whole time but you don't see it because the chlorophyll is covering over it so very interesting things uh, also in October, uh, the first grades came in, uh, two classes, Mrs. O'Connor and Mrs. Stevenson, and they did a fish-themed centers. Uh, what I love about these uh, centers is that she also has her husband come in. He takes a day off or half a day. Uh, he's a high school science teacher in Kenmore, and he'll bring in a fish. He'll purchase it from the market and actually open it up so that they can really see a true fish dissection yeah it's not for all the first grade classes and I made a center that I adapted that already had a fish skeleton in resin and the fish parts that are all safe and not like gooey and and all of that but um, what a great way to learn about the structures of their bodies and their adaptations so that they can survive and what makes them uniquely a fish um, can't say enough about it. And he went out in the morning and he caught a fish right in the pond. We still have some rock bass, or no, I mean uh, smallmouth, largemouth bass, pardon me. And he saved it safely and then he did put it back into the pond. So the kids <laughs> saw that too. <laughs> um, in November, um, some of the third grade classes came in and we were, uh, they have in the past, they've learned about turkeys. 
I said, well, let's bump this up a little bit more and talk about the structures of birds. What are their adaptations? What makes them unique to being birds? The different kinds of feathers they have and the different functions that those serve. And then I also was able to borrow um, a turkey on loan from Bond Lake Park. I used to be a member over there and uh, I have some friends. Uh, hopefully I might be able to get one of my own, but it was really nice to be able to get the kids to see up close what a real turkey looks like without, you know, the, we have turkeys around on Grand Island, but you don't want to get too close. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in this next slide, uh, you, what you're seeing are um, some of the winter field trips um, with the first, second, uh, kindergarten classes, I mean. And um, they are learning about what animals do and how they adapt in the winter time. And one of the centers that they were doing was to make some bird feeders. And so they were using some safe butter called wow butter and then uh, spreading them on bagels and seeds and so on. And they were learning about how animals survive in the winter and that some birds stay around all year long. And then in these two centers, uh, they, I do a story where I read Stranger in the Woods. And it's a lovely photographic book about animals coming into the woods and they see a snowman and they start eating food off of the snowman and then you find out at the end of the story the children have been making it. It's almost like an animal feeder. And so then they replace the seeds, they replace the carrot and the corn and, and so on. And the kids also have animal puppets to go with each animal in the story. And so they get to act it out a little bit. And in the pond room there, uh, Mrs. Simone was reading a book about hibernation, and the kids were learning uh, about the animals that they can find that hibernate um, in the pond room. So we were adding that in there. And then finally, the kindergarten kids love doing it, the teachers too, uh, getting a chance to go outside. Even if it's cold out, doesn't matter. As long as it's not really coming down over our heads, we were going out. We also did a center about tracks, so it was very exciting for them to see some deer tracks and some coyote tracks uh, that were freshly made in the snow. So that was a big deal. Um, and this one is a different field trip. Um, in January, the first grade classes will come in and we study mammals. And you'll see that I have some real animal skulls there. And just by examining them closely and looking at some of their features, you can tell whether an animal is a carnivore, an herbivore, or an omnivore. Now, would anybody want to know how? <laughs> it is not, it's not only their teeth. Yeah. Um, they will have grinding teeth in the back if they eat plants, just like we do. And they'll have the sharper teeth in the front uh, for tearing. So I explained to the kids that we are omnivores because we eat both plants and uh, animals or meat. But um, there's also their eye placement, the sockets, um, their eye sockets. Uh, herbivores, true herbivores, will have their eyes a little bit more on the side of their head as a defense so that they are looking out for their predators. So that's another thing. And then at the end of that, they get a chance to touch some real animal furs. So, and there were quite a few. There's at least 10 different ones for them to see. And I usually just leave out the ones where they are native to Grand Island. And that's what I'm focusing in on. On these last, these next two slides, um, the third grade classes will come in. And fortunately for this one, um, we do one class at a time. Many of the other field trips are two classes at a time, uh, but going back a couple, um, they're dissecting owl pellets. Do you know what an owl pellet is? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> I know Alice actually came to um, the trips that we had in February, um, but they were able to dissect and look at the bones that were left um, in the owl pellet and be able to determine whether it was a rat or a mouse, um, whether it was a bird, just by looking at the structures of the bones and the shapes of them. And they had a sorting chart where they could put the bones on there and then take it home. <laughs> um, we also, last year in April, the students from Mrs. Carpenter's high school art class 
came in, she wanted to have them do um, a watercolor art study where they could take a look at some of the animals there and um, make their own creations. So I, I added a few snapshots and they were just stunning. It's amazing what they can do. And to have the ability to use Eco Island, you know, so that they could see some of these animals up close. And even the bugs, which, you know, was on the previous slide, I mean, we have real insects that are encased in resin. And most people are like, oh, but you can hold this in your hand. You can turn it around at all sides, and you can see where their legs are connected to the, the middle part of their body, the thorax, um, without feeling any kind of threat or harm. You know, so it's really good for them. Um, I, I see that this looks very, very small. And this was a, the final slide that I have here for you. Um, was a slide that I showed at the beginning of the school year in August, but that I added on um, another line for this year's projections. So this is a number of the trips that students have made to Eco Island in the school year, and followed by the number of student visits. This year we are projected to have 74 trips with over 2,000 children coming to Eco Island this year. And I'm personally ecstatic and just so excited. So I'm hoping to continue to build on our, our Grand Island kids because I think that we are so lucky to have a nature center and no other school district that I know of has this. And we, I really want to make sure that we take care of our kids first, you know, and get them that experience. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. Any questions from the board? Yeah. How are, uh, it's really more about the interest, and I can tell you that I have a, an open calendar. I start out at the beginning of the year, and I give the teachers a link to the calendar. And that calendar, I, I can I can send you that link too. I'd be happy to show you. Um, it is a, a Google Doc, and it's a live document in that I can update it at any time. And I invite the teachers to pick out a date that isn't already avail you know that is available to them, and to get back to me, and then we can fill out a field trip. And what grade? It is not, um, there is not a requirement. They can go, I mean, I did have the art uh, students from high school come as well. It, it's really available to the whole district, but mostly it's being utilized by uh, kindergarten to grade three now. I would love to get more of the fourth grades and fifth grades in, but I also see where they're, they're, the connections are a little bit not as strong as far as their, what they are expected to teach in, um, in the classroom and being able to transfer that to Eco Island, where there is a lot, of, a lot of direct correlations to learning about animals, their structures, their adaptations in the earlier grades. But I am also trying to make myself available and amenable to creating any kind of an experience for the older kids as well. <coughs> And really, a goal is I did get more third grade classes in this year. Um, they're primarily for Kegabine, but I have peeps over at Hugh Road, and I'm working on them too. <laughs> so I'd love to see them. And I, and I love seeing new parents too. Uh, many times I've got anywhere from four to eight parents that'll come to a trip, and the first question I ask is, have you been here before? If you, not, if you haven't, let me show you around, you know, so. Oh, great, great, yes. Thank you so much. I have a quick question. Yes. Do middle school or high school students ever do anything with the pond as far as like water testing or water sampling or have we done anything along those lines? In my two short years that I've been here, that has not happened, but I welcome the opportunity. I would love that. And I know that there was something about food chains that they were talking about and the activities that we have, the hands-on activities, are a little bit thin for the um, older kids, but I would love to expand on that. I'm very open to, you know, trying new things 
That would be a great summer curriculum project for a teacher. Yes, but, it you would. You know, with the pond, so. Yes. An idea. Yes, it, it's well, a great good. idea. Cindy, I just want to thank you um, yes. for the passion you bring to the work you're doing. I know that your enthusiasm, even before this position was posted, was <laughs> that this was truly what you wanted to do. But it brings me back to my days as a science major and collecting insects and like leaf samples in my courtroom, which um, it's been a while. <laughs> uh, but as, a, as, a, as that science person that I was. Yeah, I did the same thing. <laughs> yes, this, this makes me so happy that we're doing this with our elementary levels and what a resource it is to have on Grand Island. Such yes. unique resources for our, our kids. It is, and thank you. Um, I'm hoping to try to share that enthusiasm because I know that it's really difficult for teachers to plan a field trip and to be able to put all that my energy into organizing and who's doing what and where and what kind of centers can I use and everything. So I, I really try to put myself out there and say, I'll work with you. And the calendar that I have. Um, it says 2023-2024 Eco Island Reservations Calendar. If you were to go on to that, you would see that there is a link. Those are not just names of what people are going on which day. They are links to their itinerary. So it, you can see exactly what kind of trip they're taking, what activities they're doing, and that I'm trying to make that level of transparency so that another third grade can, teacher can say, hey, my colleague's doing this. Well, this looks great. I would like to do it too. And it's about the sharing, you know, so to make it a little bit easier, work smarter, not harder. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to introduce our administrative team for our elementary and middle schools who are going to give you a strategic plan update. So if you recall back in February, the high school gave you a strategic plan update for some of the academic and other goals that the board set back in the beginning of our strategic plan five years ago. And to kind of give us a, a look on where we are, how things have evolved through the COVID pandemic and where we stand today. I think you're going to notice that some of the trends that were um, shown in the high school presentation are going to reflect themselves very similarly in some of our elementary presentations and middle school presentation. So I'm going to turn it over to the team um, who's put this presentation together collaboratively and I think they did a pretty succinct job of getting it all on there. So Thank you, Mr. Loria. Good evening, Board of Education. So we are going to be speaking on behalf of the middle school and the elementary buildings. We all came together to do the research and to come up with this presentation because we found out that a lot at the middle school and the elementary will fall underneath the same umbrellas. So I'm going to speak to the first two slides that we have here. Then there's just going to be an update to where we have gone from our strategic plan. So both at the elementary levels and the middle school levels, we have been updating our curriculum maps. They have been sent to Mr. Gloria's office, making sure that they're updated with the ICANN statements and all the standards. We've been working during PD days when available to continue to do the curriculum maps at both levels. Uh, we've also been working hard with the communication and the consistency across all grade levels. So that's specific to the three elementary buildings. They're working very hard K to five to make sure that they're using the same academic vocabulary and terminology. And the middle school has worked a lot with the high school with our monthly department chair meetings to make sure that we are going to be consistent from a six to 12 basis, making sure that we are gonna be using once again the same vocabulary and consistent across the same grade levels. Uh, we've also done a lot with training for district behavioral professionals. So we've been CPI trained by all faculty and staff at the elementary buildings, as well as the middle school um, teachers and faculty who have been working in the special classes that need the CPI training. We have all implemented sensory rooms in our classroom, and I know the Board of Education took a tour at the middle school and saw a couple of the sensory rooms that we have there that we are using on a regular basis. And the district was kind enough also to allow us to share a behavioral support specialist. So Mr. Finnan is wonderful. He does a lot of work at the elementary buildings, and he also comes over and works at the middle school building as well. And then we're getting into what I think is probably the most important piece is that we're talking about the student social skills development. And at the elementary level, they're doing a lot with character education. They're doing a lot with the lunch bunches and peer buddies and making sure that 
all students are working and learning to be better students, but also gaining some character education. And at the middle school, obviously we have the web program, which is absolutely fantastic. Our teachers have done a wonderful job. And I do applaud the high school. What they put on tonight, it looks like it's going to be a wonderful pilot, and I'm super excited to see it carrying over into the high school because character education is crucial at all grade levels, and I'm really excited about the program at the high school. So now I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Schiller. Anthony. So I'll share a little bit of information just about our reading progress. Really, all this is going to be just from the last three years. Um, although the strategic plan did start five years ago, we no longer use the assessment program that was linked to the old strategic plan. So it's hard to see if we reach those goals. So we decided to do rather was show our growth in the last three years, so post-COVID, to kind of show our current progress in reading and math over the last three years and use that information to help us guide our goals for the next strategic plan. You're going to see a lot of these charts and these colors. These are a combination of data that we get from our data results when our kids take the IRA assessments as administrators in our building, and also data we get when we meet with the IRA team twice a year as well when they come in from the data that they've collected and they analyze and give to us. Really what you're looking at is green is good, yellow is in the middle, red is below. Uh, so you're going to see the same colors throughout. Green is going to be on grade level or above grade level. That's where you want your kids to be at the end of the year. Yellow is going to be one grade level below. Red is going to be two or more grade levels below or at risk for like a tier three intervention. So that's kind of what the colors you're going to see. Those are going to stay consistent throughout all the slides. Um, if you look at, I don't know if you guys have a paper copy in front of you as well, but just for example, if you look at like 2022, 2023, the triangles next to where the green says 84%, to the right of it, it says from 17%, but that 17% is the September percentage <laughs> that were on grade level. So in that particular year, it was 17% at the beginning of the year and 84 at the end of the year. So that kind of lets you show the growth, even though it's not on the triangle, it does show you the growth as well. So the first slide here would be for Sidway over the last three years. So again, what we're looking for as building administrators is that the percentage of the triangle that's green is obviously growing. That's what we, we want to see, that more kids are on grade level at the end of the classroom. So your first three slides for reading are going to be specific to grade levels. So, so Mike, is that for everything? Is that for reading? All the components of reading. Okay. So all the different Sorry, components that are individually assessed. Paper. Yep. So all this is specifically reading now, not math. Got it. Is this measured against like a national database or what it, is this? Yes. These are not, this is on grade level. We do have the data against National, New York State, and the North as well, which I will show you guys also. So we have both. I think I, think I just want to mention too, that they are renormalizing this data this current year. Um, just <laughs> just you stealing my information. Okay, no, I'm going to let you go. <laughs> no one to back out. <laughs> Uh, if you go to the next slide, you're going to be able to look at Kegabyte's data, which again, reading data, so which has stayed consistent over the last three years. I think it's also important to note that we are currently uh, convening a literacy committee, K-5, to and doing a lot of work to look at the curriculums we offer and decide what direction we're going to head in next year just with all the changes in philosophy. So obviously great that we stayed consistent and moved up um, in the elementary schools and middle schools, but still looking at new things to add to our teachers' toolboxes as well. The next slide would be Youth Road. And then finally, the fourth one with these similar charts would be the middle school as well. So again, a lot of the STAR data comparisons was looking around 60% to 65% proficiency was their measure. We don't know how that correlates to iReady, but being that we are hanging in that, post-COVID is a good starting point, I think, to look at the next five years to kind of grow from there. This next comes from our iReady team, so this is data that's brought to us, and this is going to show you K-8 collectively, the growth made the 2003 to 2024 school year from September just to the winter. So it's good to note there is you want to be at about 50% in the green at the halfway point of the year. That means you're on pace to be at 100 by the end of the year. Um, so if you're looking at us K-8, 23 to 24, we are hanging right around that 50% on grade level at the midpoint of the school year. So obviously you have the whole year to get there. This is showing where we're at just at the halfway point. So we do a halfway point collection, and then obviously an end of the year collection. So the first chart you saw were all full year data. This would be a half year data for 2023, 2024. Yes. So does this include all of our enrolled students? This, yes. 
how to swallow them in our that that one that is K to eight right there. I don't know about <coughs> Does that include our students in our eight one ones? Or is this just our work? Okay. Everybody. Okay, so I just want to look we look at Q um the whole triangles here, right? Thirteen percent at Kagabine at whereas Q was at five percent and then PCMS you know those numbers it's 22.1.5 percent as as we go through why why do those numbers change so much when we're sitting at 12 and 13 percent coming out of here to kind of mine so then how does that drop That's what it means. i mean is there any logic to that is there any correlation to that it's just it, for 13 as if it's a level of reading changes so i don't know the reason what i can tell you is it does stay consistent to the national trends okay. and the new york state trends okay but that is a big reason we do have the literacy committee yeah. up and specifically looking right now at three to five and that gap and looking to better prepare kids for middle school and support them for middle school. So it's, I mean, the data agrees with what we're spending our time and resources and really looking at as a curriculum team. No, I, I understand that. I just yeah. to see a 10% change. I just think if they have it, they have it. Thank you. It's also a little misleading if you look at like the Sidway data specifically, because a kindergartner can't be two grade levels below. Right, no, right. So right, there right. isn't going to be red in kindergarten. So you have to also understand that the gap is able to grow as children get older because there is more availability to fall behind more grade levels over time. Well, I if think that the makes difficulty, sense. right? And, and, uh, right, right. I get it. You had the lucky book, you always look like. <laughs> 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 they say I cheat. <laughs> um, what this is is a breakdown. I'm going to where you go. You go back to one, I think. Here. So this is the same data from the last slide, just broken out by grade level. So your fall data compared to your winter data, 2023 to 2024, so this current school year. You can look at the growth between where students came in the beginning of school year to where they are in about Jan middle of January this year. So again, it's not final end of the year data. It's one data point. Could be. So Jay, this is against your norms. So this would be looking at the district, K-8. On the right, and then on the left side, you're looking at national norms, national year to date, and New York State year to date. And what Mike was alluding to earlier is the most recent national norms is 2018, 2019, and why that's significant is that is pre-COVID. And if you look to the right of that, both the national norms and the New York State norms have not caught up to where students were pre-COVID. So really the good news on this slide is Grand Island is surpassed the, the norm used pre-COVID. Um, iReady is going to update their norms next year to more current, and they're going to be lower. We know that, so, which is fine. But what's nice is that we are ahead of where at least the nation was pre-COVID. So that's a, that's a big win for us as a district. And then the next one is going to be grade levels against those same norms. So you're going to see the national norms, the national year to date, and the district, and the New York State year to date. So again, you're able to look at individual grade levels and where we are performing so far this year compared to those norms and the current nation and the current New York State schools that use IRA. Okay, we're going to shift gears over to math. A lot of what Mr. Antelli just said, I'll be repeating because it's kind of the same idea. We have the three triangles for each building, and you're going to notice for each of the slides, um, there's a general trajectory of an increase for every uh, for the last three years for our math in our math department. Um, and I'd like to say that the reason because of the reason for that is because we have had at least three years in our with our iReady math program. It's allowing us to support this growth we're seeing in math. 
or across all of our buildings, you're going to notice, and Dr. Graham, you can move on to the next slides here. Every slide you'll see green increasing, red decreasing. That's what we want to see. We want to see the, the uh, green going up every single, of course, school year. So Kegabine is going up, youth is going up as well. Um, same um, idea as the reading. So we're doing really well with that, and again, we are working hard on using our iReady math program to support our teachers. Over the past three years, we've been speaking to the BOCES um, representative and the iReady representatives to really uh, uh, look at data and use that to drive our instruction. We're focusing on how we can use the tools within the program to, pro to provide interventions both inside of the Tier 1 classroom as well as our Tier 2 and Tier 3 with our support providers, which is integral to making sure that we close that gap uh, more and more throughout the school years. I know we're focused on put, giving our students the interventions inside of the classroom so we're not identifying so early in their uh, academic careers. Um, this, the teachers are a lot more comfortable now than they were, of course, at the beginning of the program when we started using it. There's a lot to sit through with the program, but I think um, it's, it's showing because I think there's great growth. This uh, slide, along, just like the reading was, the reading slide, we're seeing great growth in the fall to winter already. And uh, Dr. Graham, you can move on to the next slide there. And it's showing the uh, growth by grade level. The national norm, again, like Mr. Antonio said, was 18, 19 school year. But we, as you can see, we're still on par and we've made growth in math for in every grade level. Um, can you go one more slide, Dr. As you'll see here, we are doing, uh, we're just on par with the national norm. Of course, it's 1819 school year. And uh, we're compared to the national and the New York State year to date, we're doing very well. Um, oh, the, the norms are going to be, I think, what we're going to need to do after the norms have been have released, which they haven't released for next school year. We're going to need to identify how we're going to change our thresholds to identify students who need Tier 2 and Tier 3 interventions, which is going to be key for us. Because, we, as Mr. Nintendo said, they are going to be, we're going to have lower scores. Our percentile ranks are going to go lower, or will be lower for our students, because our national norms are, been, are going to be lower than they are now, due to the force of the post-pandemic. Uh, post um, but I think, in general, math has made a great growth and I think it's in largely the support of the, because of the iReady program we've had for the last three years now. <laughs> Any questions with me? Can I just jump in right there? Just sure. to make the comparison between high school and middle school and elementary now, we have seen some of these similar trends where we've seen consistent progress in math. I mean, I can't, it's not all perfect, but we have seen that, that, that steady growth in math. We have implemented a new elementary program which seems to be working, we've mm -hmm. also seen some growth in our state assessment scores and 3 through 8 math scores. Um, ELA, I went at, at, the, at the high school level, we mentioned some concern that our ELA scores are not seeing that steady growth. We're seeing kind of the same trend, we're not seeing it being terrible, we're just not seeing the growth. And we've spent the entire two years probably now talking about ELA and where to go with our reading program. So we will be continuing to have more information on that at the end, but I just wanted to I have a quick two-part question too. Does this program give you specific skills that students are um, not successful with? So just break down by math skill, and then the second part to that question would be: What do we do when students don't know it or haven't mastered a specific skill? So do they know it, and then when they don't, what what do we do? So we definitely have the ability inside of our programs to drill down specific skills and standards that our students are weak in, which is what we are all throwing in our buildings. The next step is the interventions, the tier one interventions. So we're focusing on what do teachers do inside the classroom to address the students who are deficient in whatever skill or, or standard. And I, I know that we talk a lot about, say, small group instruction as one of those interventions. We try and find ways to get in front of students in a small group setting to diagnose and intervene earlier on. Um, so we're catching those students earlier on, so we're not identifying them in tier two or tier three later on in their school years. I'll just oh, add. Sorry. There's also a my. <laughs> yeah. There's yeah. also yeah. A, a my path as well that is a individualized um, instructional program that students do independently, and that 
adapts to their ability level as they answer those questions. So if the students are doing really well, they're answering the questions correctly, the ceiling goes higher and higher. If they are doing poorly, if they answer incorrectly, it stays at a different level. But that's where we get all the data, is where we can pinpoint exactly where they fall inside of that my path. So there's an individualized instruction built into the program that will look at your <coughs> and say, hey, you're missing these skills, these topics, and they will build up those in their independent practice time so that when they're doing their independent practice, it's addressing those deficiencies, we'll call them. So hopefully that will help. That's one of the things it's really great. It makes it individualized. It looks like it's helping a lot of the one grade level or two grade levels on. If you're three or more, it's really helping them stay a little bit more consistent. So it looks like that, that needs a little bit more work. Right. Well, that's where we can diagnose and we hopefully will um, identify those kids early on um, and hopefully catch them if there's a small group instruction. <coughs> I have a quick question. So, mm -hmm. is this data driven from like uh, a test day, like one given day that kids come in and they take a test card? We have windows. We have diagnostic windows. Every um, three times a year, there's like two weeks. We provide teachers two week time period where they have to have their diagnostics done. And inside that two week time period, they have um, they have to get their math already test done and they have to do their um, three diagnostic within two weeks. So it's essentially two tests within two weeks for every kid. Once to begin the school year, once in January, and once in June, May or June. So it's three times a year. So it's there. There are three times a year that they're really hit uh, with two different tests. Okay. okay. So it's a snippet in time. It is a snippet in so, time. Yes. So my question yeah. is, Billy comes in, he doesn't care, right? Right. Especially so. I, I guess I'm talking to the middle schools, right? Like the change. So. Is, are those test scores, I will call them, I know they don't, they don't matter, are they looked at at the actual grades that the kids are getting? Like if, he come, if, if a student comes in and just flubs it, right? Do you right. look to see how he's actually doing in class compared to, to what he did on those? The program, if it, the program will realize, I'll say, identify students who are, for lack of a better term, heavy clicking. Okay, so they're clicking, 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 but they're not really taking the time. They will call those students the rush, rush, they'll put a rush flag on them so we can identify those and make them, of course. But they might not necessarily be rush clicking. They may just not be giving them 100% is what I'm saying. So, you know, somebody, so somebody who is an excellent math student could come in and be like, lackadaisy, right? right. And, you know, not give us all and not score what he could score. Not necessarily happy. Right. be done in five minutes because then it's time. Right? Is there any correlation given in yeah. that case? I, I think you do have an incentive, right? Is what no, I'm not asking for an incentive. I'm, 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 what yeah. I'm saying right. is, do you look to say, yeah. okay, so so it's my son. He right. comes in, he blows it, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're trying to drill down to find out what, what his issue was. Right. And really, he had a bad day. And we understand that, and we all know that. So I'm just wondering if there's any, and I'm not saying yeah. it was my son, I'm just saying in yeah. that, is there any look back to what you are actually doing in the past? We consider everything, and it, we know it's one point in time, we, much like any other assessments. Um, and we'll consider other things that will help us figure out what, yeah. where to go from there. So back to the happy clicking, or <laughs> the, you <laughs> know, <laughs> lackadaisical <laughs> child <laughs> maybe that doesn't really mm -hmm. care about this assessment. Is there any incentive to get them to care to do well on the test so we know that we're actually measuring their best performance so we know that they really don't know what's being shown on the test and they really do, I mean obviously if they get it right, it's probably more than just luck if it's... Classroom teachers do have incentives within their, in their classrooms. There's not a school-wide one I would say that I have in my building, um, uh, but I know classroom teachers have like they have the students know what their, their, their goal, they create goals for students. And so the students are trying to reach those goals, they're trying to help them reach that goal for the diagnostics. So they drive it inside the classroom with those specific kinds of um, incentives. And Max, I think too, uh, excuse me, <coughs> if a child uh, was just you know, happy clicking or just moving right. too quickly, uh, sometimes this data leads to the, the possibility of academic intervention services. Mm -hmm. So the, the intrinsic motivator there, if you know your stuff, 
show us so that it's not skewing the data so that you have to get pulled out or yeah. tier two or tier three uh, interventions. Yeah. So, and lastly, I, I would add <coughs> that our principals get a, a document from me because we have created an early warning system in Forecast 5 Analytics, and that includes iReady, Math, and ELA. It includes uh, grade level uh, scores, you know, their actual summative report card grades, attendance, behavior, or it's all combined. So when our principals can sit and lead their academic intervention teams and their child study team, they can, they have a broad uh, take, of, you know, the 30,000 foot view of what happened in the previous year, and then they make professional decisions and really needs academic intervention. Well, it's like because they're just not good at standardized <coughs> testing. They're just, I mean, it's it's proven, it's known, right? It's you know, some some kids that are, I mean, SATs, ACTs, right? It's it's known. That's why I was just wondering if there's any look back. I mean, people, you, you have to know your students, right? That's, really that's why I was it, just asking the question. There isn't really a lot of right as administrators, but I can tell you that multiple times I've had a teacher walk in and go, Johnny just finished his eye writing, this doesn't match yet, right? That's and what I guess I'm the teacher. So it's yes. really the, so this data isn't really what we're using every day. This is much more macro data to share with you guys. What we're looking at is individual classroom data, individual student data, groupings of students for interventions based on the specific reading or math skill they're deficient in to group them together. This is more to share with you. What we're looking at actually has names attached to it with teachers and students, not really a grade level or a school. We also right. no, I understand that. Yeah. Right. I also, personally, I look at growth as well because we can drill down and see how much a student has grown. And if their growth is typical or stretch, which they call those two things, that's another factor in what we might do for interventions. Um, so that's just another key. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm going to go over the next group of slides um, where we look at some of the New York State assessment data for ELA and math for grades three through eight over the past three years. The format of the assessment was different each year. Um, so in 2021, students were only assessed using session one of the test. And in 2022, when we came back from COVID, they were assessed in sessions one and two. And then in 2023, it changed again to align with the next generation state standards for math and ELA. You can go to the next slide, Dr. Graham. Um, and then this just gives information um, broken down in regards to the percent of test refusals for students in grade three through eight each year. And then it's also important to note that any student who was receiving remote instruction in 2021 was not assessed. And this is just looking at ELA, but math is the same format. Um, then you're going to see a set of line graphs for Kegwine Youth in the Middle School, and it represents the proficiency levels for students in grades 3 through 8 in both ELA and math again. And then um, any students who score a 3 or 4 on those assessments are what is considered to be proficient by the state. So that is Kegwine for ELA, and then we have Youth, ELA, and the Middle School. And then on the next slide, um, you see where Grand Island ranks in Erie County and all of New York State in grades three through eight for ELA and math assessments. So if you flip through the next group, Dr. Graham, then we have our math as well. And I know you have it in front of you, so I don't know if you have any questions about that. Okay. Yes. Uh, do you want to throw a little uh, thanks to one of your teachers who goes to the state and helps? Yes, uh, Kathy Chadwick. In the math area. Yes, she goes and she right helps write questions. Right questions for New York State for our students to be assessed in. So she does awesome work with that. All right, and then I'm going to turn it over to Adam to wrap it up on what's next for us. Uh, so what's next? The middle school and the elementary school got together and we came up with some ideas and some goals that we'd like to put forth to uh, the next strategic plan that we're speaking to. And one of them is to create uh, that they've already been in the process of implementing a comprehensive literacy program to improve the reading and the writing skills in K to, uh, three, grades three through five. Also to review the science resources 
in New York State standards and how they've adjusted in the new assessment needs that we're doing because now we are a CBT as well for the science assessment. Uh, the STEM program, the robotics integration. Review of the curriculum maps, we're going to continue to do that. We're going to also promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in the school community. Continue to support students' social and emotional needs. And we're doing that at every single level. And a big push for both levels is going to be the incentive that we have for the attendance to educate middle school students, but also the elementary schools. The significance of coming to school and the importance of doing that. I know at the middle school level we are really uh, taking a hard stance with attendance, making sure students are coming to school, and that we are going to be openly communicating with families if they're not. And um, yeah, that's it. We've seen some of these posters through throughout the middle school too. Your attendance managers posters. So I appreciate that. Yeah, Mrs. Fox um, adjusted it. They came from another district, and she kind of modeled it to do for uh, VCMS. So we've been putting it up and also through our attendance meetings, sharing with families and trying to educate the importance of of coming to school, or more so communicating with us for reasoning if they're having difficulties coming. I just want to add that the first goal um, that was mentioned in the elementary implementing a comprehensive literacy program for reading um, is something that we spent a lot of time on. Our, our literacy committee met just last week and has made a recommendation for a new reading program for grades three through five. Um, I will be bringing that recommendation to you at our next board meeting with a little bit more information and also asking for us to consider it for our textbook approval process, even though it's not overall program, it's got digital features. But it's the magnetic reading program through curriculum associates, and I want to say just how happy and proud I am that we have actually all, as a committee and as an elementary um, you know, K through five program, come to a, a consensus, and I think everyone. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions? Okay. Um, <laughs> we're going to take a short five minute break and ask students to uh, come on up and have us sign any sheets that need to be signed so you can be dismissed. And then um, if anyone needs to get up and stretch, go ahead. So uh, continue on. Personnel instruction on page Motion to approve P1 through P4, please, for instructional and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carries 7 0. And if I could have a motion to approve PNI 1 through PNI 4, please. And a second? All in favor? Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 7 0. Any there? Do we have any questions? No, no interim reductions, right? Okay. Yeah, we, we did. Boy, sparse out here. Uh, I'm here finance. Uh, if I could have a motion to approve finance A, a TOPS donation. And a second. All in favor? Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? And Dr. Marco, I'd like to review the um, information items before the budget. Yes, so uh, items B, C, and D are informational. Uh, B is the treasurer's report, C is the revenue status report, and then D is the check warrants for February. And then E is the third budget presentation. Dr. Dreyer, is it okay if we just kind of clean up a few things, maybe just go to special ed and get that taken. Sure, yeah. sure. Okay. We'll go to that. It's a good motion for AB. Thank you. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any objections? Any extensions? Motion carried 7-0. Thank you very much. So uh, today, as the board probably has seen in its review, there are just some minor changes to the 
previous budget presentation. The big information that we're going to be waiting for, of course, is how the state uh, adapts and is flexible with respect to the, the executive budget as it was first drafted and all the pressure not only locally from senators and assembly people, uh, superintendents and teachers, but uh, throughout the entire state. So uh, we do know that the one house uh, bill that combines the Senate and assembly requests back to the governor has requested a 3% additional additional uh, percentage on foundation aid from the previous year. As the board knows, when looking at the presentations, we're uh, set to lose out at about 159000 But if the governor accepts the Senate and Assembly's uh, draft uh, budget that they're pushing for, we could see up to 3%, which we would be very pleased as well. So, so that, with that missing information, it is difficult sometimes to uh, show you uh, significant changes. So um, I do want to go back. Uh, whoa, so sometimes we have to look at different screens. But uh, uh, have you made any adjustments to the agenda or anything of that nature? The only uh, major material change was on um, the major impact items. Uh, I did change uh, some of the categories on those items. I did share with the board uh, those changes. Um, but the, the only number that really changed on there was for uh, the, the uh, benefits for health insurance. Uh, I did include an updated uh, health insurance number and subtracted uh, the portion that would be contributed by employees for their contract. Um, okay. so and we'll get to those, right, in the yeah. slides. I just was curious, as far as the agenda goes, pretty much the same as last time. Right. Yes, sorry. sorry about that. Bob, with respect to health insurance, what's the cost that we pay for the employee for health insurance this uh, The family plan is about $29,000. Uh, the employee spouse, I believe, is around $26,000. Employee and children, I want to say, is around $22,000. And then the single plan, I believe, is about ten or $11,000. Thank you. For enrollment, really no changes since you know, the last time we were together. Um, so uh, you've seen these slides. Really nothing has changed. I'm going to jump ahead to uh, the uh, presentation that teachers made at the last budget um, session. And I just want to show that uh, this uh, we will make some adjustments as it relates to projected uh, enrollment at the uh, middle school. So you'll see that uh, for this is current enrollment and then for next year you'll see that this will stay and this portion of the slide will go away based on the board's feedback uh, at the last uh, budget session. I went through that pretty quickly. apologize. Is there any feedback or comments from the board based on uh, the presentation last time or that's correct. Yeah. And that seemed to be the, the direction that the board wanted. Very good. So, um, so the, this is a new slide that shows the board that based on the retirements that we showed you uh, last session, that we are <laughs> recommending that we reduce one elementary teacher, meaning that teacher has uh, said that that teacher will retire. So instead of hiring back another elementary teacher, our recommendation is to reduce by attrition. Uh, but however, we definitely need the secondary Spanish, we need the guidance counselor at the high school, and we need the science teacher at uh, the middle school. Any questions about this recommendation? So, uh, so uh, this is the proposed budget um, at the current state. You'll see that uh, it did go down slightly from last time based on those health care uh, adjustments that I spoke of. Um, on the bottom there, uh, there are some remaining requests that we still need to decide on. Those total about $244,537. Um, we'll get there in just a second. I will show you specifically what those requests um, are still, um, the ones that are still there. The governor uh, executive budget recap.
cap has not changed. Um, I did include a slide, uh, so the finance and legislation team at Gary one Bosey's put together some historical um, perspective on how they've decided on the budget. So if you take a look at this, um, the executive budget are the green bars, the assembly budget are the, the uh, one proposed by the assembly are the orange bars, the ones proposed by the Senate are the uh, light blue bars, and then the actual uh, budget that was adopted are the dark blue bars. So you can see over time uh, how those compare to each other. Um, sometimes, uh, often the, the executive the uh, the executive is quite a bit lower than what the assembly and the Senate propose, and uh, the actual uh, typically ends up being kind of somewhere in between those numbers. So just to give you some uh, historical perspective on what's happened over the last several years, and uh, obviously this year is to be determined, but you can see in the 20, uh, the 24-25 um, area on the right, the executive proposal is $825 million. The, um, the assembly is $1.8 billion, and the Senate is $2.427 billion. So uh, there is quite a, quite a gap between the executive's proposal and their proposals. Um, my guess is, is, you know, it'll be somewhere slightly above the executive's proposal, hopefully. That's what we're, we're hoping to see. Uh, the state aid proposal has not changed at this time. Um, and Bob, we expect that the governor will enact her budget April 1st as the deadline. We will be on spring break, and the chances uh, last year her budget was delayed, right. but we knew what we were going to get, so we weren't concerned that it was delayed. This year it is a concern, and we hope that the governor enacts a budget that is representative of the Senate and Assembly's endorsement. Uh, so maybe when we come back from spring break, we'll have some more information. Correct. Possibly. Uh, the information we have right now is that it is kind of expected to be delayed past April 1st. Um, they're just coming back to session this week, and then, and then they end session for um, Easter, and then they come back next week. So uh, at this time, we're not necessarily expecting them to be done by April 1st, but they are cognizant that we need to get our budgets going, so, you know, they will be working very hard to get stuff done. And across the state, this is huge information. Half the states, or half the districts, have been uh, impacted negatively based on the governor's first draft of her budget, and uh, the work going on behind the scenes to advocate for more for our students is significant, and we do hope that the governor is listening to that. So please be patient with us. We may not have all the information for you until the next meeting, which is April June? April 16th. April 16th. Yes. So I, I was going to bring up later, but uh, the April 9th uh, tentative meeting, we probably won't have more information by then, so we don't, we don't, I don't think we need to, to schedule that special meeting. Uh, I think we'll just go right to April 16th, and everything ready for that hopefully um, based on the numbers that we um, so just a minor change here, the uh, basic budget summary of all revenues decreased slightly based on those health care numbers. The major expenditures, um, I did, as I, I stated earlier, I did recategorize some stuff. I took a look at how things were categorized in the past and adjusted how I categorized things um, to, to better match that so we could get a better picture of the true year-over-year -year difference. Um, some of the major adjustments were uh, the substitute. I had some things categorized in that category that should have been categorized in the salary category. Um, so that substitute number did not appear to go up quite, quite as significantly as in the previous presentation. Um, and then there was a few things in the other category that should have been in other categories. Most notably, uh, there was uh, several health care costs that were in the other category that should have been in the benefits category. Um, so we moved those up, and then, um, as I stated, the benefits category went up a bit to, um, to reflect the, the increase in uh, 
healthcare based on some more final numbers that we've received. And again, you know, we're still working on a lot of these numbers, still getting a lot of these numbers, you know, with contracts, things like that. So, um, and then I subtracted off the employee contribution. Um, all of the employees have some contribution that varies uh, contract by contract. Um, so the bottom line uh, went down to 77,111,682. But again, these numbers, that number does not include any potential contract settlements at this time. Hopefully we will have those numbers uh, for April 16th as well. Um, I did also provide, uh, based on the board's question, a uh, detailed um, accounting of the other category, um, as well as answers to some questions that I had received. Is there any more questions on that or anything I can further explain to the board? I'll uh, hear those questions. I did include, uh, so that the packet that I handed out at the beginning uh, did address those questions. So um, the first uh, 18 or 20 pages here are the accounting of the other category line by line is requested. And then, so um, I did include, uh, so if you get past that and you get to the sheet that says uh, A1010.400-02, that's the BOE, the Board of Education contract line. Um, so I did give you a detailed accounting of that line. So most of that is used to pay the uh, New York State School Boards Association membership fee and the Erie County Association of School Board fee. Um, and then the miscellaneous line is used for um, different uh, publications, things like that, um, food for various events. The conference and travel line is, is used for any conference and travel expenses that are incurred. And then also the uh, supply line and how that's used. And then um, there was a question about the unallocated insurance contractual. And so that is primarily our um, our liability insurance to NYSER. That's uh, that was almost three hundred thousand dollars this year, um, and then we also have uh, our student accident insurance through AG administrators, um, along with some other various costs in there. But those are primarily the two biggest things that make up that category. Um, there was a question about. The unclassified contract, that budget is $4,500. That has not been used in a couple of years. The last time I did include a sheet there, the last time that was used was in the 2021 school year, and that was um, it, uh, had, had an expense of $22,612. Um, I believe that was for some um, special ed contractual items uh, back then. And then, uh, so it hasn't been used in a couple years, but we still hold for it. Correct. Correct. Yes, ma'am. And, and it, you know, there's some of those things. That there's the, the budget is a breathing thing, right? So we, we try to find the best we can for everything. And, you know, um, but there's some things on occasion that don't get used a certain year, and then another year we get used. So. Um, then the next page is all of the miscellaneous categories that uh, were asked for. So you can see the various uh, miscellaneous categories that are used there. Uh, the public info miscellaneous, that one is about $4,000. So far, about $2,000 that has been expended. But a lot of times that's used to send out publications from the board. We'll probably use the other half of that when we send out the um, budget vote information uh, to, to all the district residents. So I guess the, the question I have with all the other system things other is, is there any way, because I know we have a short film for is there any way that any of these can somehow be mitigated down, any of these costs, or have they been looked at where over the past couple of years maybe it's 
X amount of dollars, which is less than you know what we're hoping for, to kind of work towards balancing without removing uh, you know, educational kids. Yeah. So that's a, a challenging question, I would say. So. With most of the items in the other category, most of them have not been increased over the past seven years. And as we all know, the cost of everything has increased over the past several years. So, you know, what they've been able to use those dollars for has shrunk more and more in those years. So, uh, to answer your question, yes, there's probably some areas we can find some savings, but. Two hundred fifty thousand. We would be taking away. Well, I'm not away saying the full. Yeah, I'm not saying the full. I'm just saying to help contribute toward that short. You know, if there's any way that we can look at this and see is there a way that some of this can be. You know, if it hasn't certain things, I understand have to be all But are there other are there other items that maybe are less and have been continuously been less over time, but we're always charging more? Or something that has never been used or hasn't been used in five, six years that maybe we can do something else just to kind of offset it so the kids are not at a disadvantage mm -hmm. for something that's administrative that's just kind of sitting in a, in a pool. Yeah. In, you know, in and I, you know, I can I can most certainly take a look at that, um, but I, I will also say that you know sometimes we need more in an area, and you know sometimes sure. we'll you know look at that later in the year and say all right. We overspent in this category, so let's take the money in this category that has been going for a couple years on the road. So, you know, the more we take away from that, you know, we can basically do accommodate for program limits, especially later on in the year. So, so we can most certainly take a look and, and take a double check and see if there's anything. Contractual busing versus the vehicle purchase busing. How is that going to work? Are we? Is that both going to be implemented? We have a bond allocated for contracting, and then we have a bond for allocated for purchase of new buses too, right? Correct. So, is there? Can you just um, better explain why both are being? Um, necessary for 2023, or I'm sorry, for next year's budget? Yeah, so, you know, that's where it gets challenging, right? So, the contract busing is kind of a band-aid right now. So, but with the with the bus replacement plan, you know, buses last about 10 years, that's our current replacement cycle. So, if we were to stop that replacement cycle, we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot down the road. So. That's where you're in a catch-22 of trying to maintain the, the current program in hopes that you know, we can get the staff to, to get back where you don't need the contractual lesson. Uh, so you're almost kind of paying for it twice, but it's hard to get around that right now because of the situation that we're in. Our hope is to get away from the contract busing and to get back into a fully staff program. Um, so it, it's, it's quite, you know, it, it's challenging. And um, you know we're going to look to um, do a study in uh, our transportation department and get some guidance on you know what the best way forward would be um, to come up with a longer term solution. So, I have two questions. So the first one is: Are we still looking at the garbage department and we're going to land on the dollar I I took that transfer out. So we're not going to transfer the 100,000 to the group this year? Right. Okay. Second part, and bear with me, let me get the question out for all of you out there. So I see we're looking to do an equipment increase for all of our students. Now right. I understand um, there's money in the budget on those lines. I understand the pricing is going up. Have we ever looked at, or is it, have we ever looked at doing that kind of like we did with the technology and equipment or our fitness center and putting it going through the buildings, realizing their needs, putting it on a plan, two year plan, five year plan, ten year plan, and really uh, addressing the needs as a whole so that we can instead of increasing it every year, maybe 
what to the needs, make a plan, and if it's a big expense, putting it into a capital project. I don't, I, you know, I mean, we're looking here, it's, you know, it's quite a bit of money that we're adding to an existing line item. And I realize, obviously, the need for the equipment. I mean, there are desks here in the high school that I sat in myself, right? So I, I don't, I'm not saying no, but I'm just saying is that a different way we could look at it and have a plan for it. <laughs> you know, I just, you know, I mean, I mean, that's yeah. a big chunk. No, it, it's, it's a great question. So, you know, a, a couple thoughts on that. You know, in regards to capital projects, the, none of those things would be needed on the capital project. So, so uh, we wouldn't, we wouldn't get any building aid on a capital project. And you know, so so part of the reason that I recommended the the increase in the equipment budget is because. We've had so little in there in the past several years, they haven't really been able to do much. And the, the need just keeps growing and growing and growing. So I, I agree, a long-term plan is probably a great idea um, and something that we most certainly be, be willing to do. Um, but with the way we current, uh, currently are, the current uh, budget levels for the schools, they really can't do almost anything with that. So at least this will give them something small to at least be able to replay, replace a couple tables a year or a few desks. It's really not a ton, um, but I agree we should probably look at longer term planning. Yeah, I, I was just trying, I thought, I thought there was a book but when I was looking through this, and of course it's very hard to look through these, but you know, I don't I don't know what's allocated per year. I'm just wondering, in, in, um, you know, yeah, like, so, that replaced the um, tables and chairs in their cafeteria. I think Sidway would like to move as partially. I don't know if I is there, but I mean, really, if you, if, if you put together a plan, you would better budget for that, right? Yeah. Instead of trying to throw you know, $3,700 at it every year, it's really, what can they buy with $3,700? Yeah. Well, it's kind of. I can't buy know, a couch for my living. Right now, buy, you know, they have 1500 Couple of those schools have 1,500. You know, Kegelbine, uh, Youth, and, and uh, Sidway all have 1,500 dollars this year. So, I'm looking at this 2100, 2110.200-05 that says teaching equipment for 33,000. Yeah, so that's a district line that we use uh, when there's emergencies to purchase. Okay. So for example, we had to purchase some uh, some gas ranges for high school this year. Well, we've had some, some emergency advice. Because I thought in years past we have increased these equipment lines in the past. So you're telling me that you've only has $1,500 on their equipment line? Yes, ma'am. And, and uh, they were decreased at some point. Okay. I don't know if it was last year or the year before, I can't recall, but they were decreased at, at some point in the recent past. I still think going forward we need to come up with a plan, like a replacement plan like we did in the tech wing um, that we did for our fitness center. I think I think then we can get a better handle on what yep. is needed and set a plan, right? And yep. then we're not that that may be included in their uh we can do a building condition service. I'm not sure if that equipment is included. Some of it will be I know some of it might not be, so um, but I'd be happy to work with yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if that would be helpful, something you guys would be interested in, but I, I really think it would help us as a board and a district to really get a handle on what is needed, what the actual cost is, and then we can make a five year plan. And ten. I don't know what it would look like with the cost, but I think it would really help us make a better financial plan. You know, trying to because of those things that are not aidable, it would probably be great for a capital outlay project too. I don't know how far out our capital outlay projects don't know. I don't think we can do furniture, no, things no, like that. Furniture. I don't think we can. But I do like the long term idea. I would say I walk by the middle school every day that furniture is not it is very outdated. It's very outdated. Are you talking about the long term? Middle school long term. Yes, yeah. yeah. So I understand the need. I just I, I think it, it is, you know, like that. 
comparison with him, it's very expensive to change out all of I'm those data. Sure it but it'd be good to look at it with some projected costs, for sure. Any additional questions on the major impact? Thank you. budget overview. This accounts for all of the increases uh, year over year. Um, so we saw an increase of uh, 3.5 uh, million dollars and so if you go through these items uh, they will all add up to that 3.83 million dollars. So in the human resources with Compensation, compensation changes again. This does not include any collective, uh, any new collective bar bargaining settlements. Um, but all of those categories on um, <coughs> resources, um, the BOCES budget, we expect an increase, increase in special education costs um, for about three hundred thirty-seven thousand in the instructional program, school buildings. Uh, we did ask for. Uh, those increase is in equipment. I will note that uh, the high school equipment line there, uh, that was an increase of $32,500. Um, and, and the equipment costs that I did ask for additionally were proportionate to the student population at that building. So I looked at the number of students there and kind of distributed that accordingly. For the high school, that $32,500 includes, excuse me, includes the $25,000 that was committed to the technology program under the athletics budget. Uh, it's a $17,000 increase. 15000 of that is for the fitness center commitment. Um, so there's the <coughs> fitness subtotals and then district wide supplies year over year went up about 18000 9000 in conference and travel. Uh, and then contractual. Uh, obligations increased about 82,410,000 in total. Uh, support services, uh, you see the, the 400,000 in contractual transportation there. Fuel increase of about 10,000 estimated. Operations and maintenance, 37,232 uh, there uh, for a total of 447,000. Debt service, um, our, as we pay down our past debt, the interest goes down significantly and the principal goes down as well. So um, we'll see about $370,000 in savings there. That does impact our tax cap. So um, that money that, that comes off of there actually de decreases the amount that we can um, raise the tax levy in, a, in the following year. And then uh, the transfer to food service, uh, you'll see a negative $85,000 year over year. That, that's the, uh, that would be that food service transfer that is no longer going to happen. Um, so it, it looks, it's a negative because it's year over year. So last year we did the transfer. This year we wouldn't. That's what was in the budget. So the total appropriations increase would be that $3.4 million. And then the revenues have not changed, um, so our total in, uh, revenue increase would be about 700000 leaving us a budget-to-budget -budget gap of $2.7 million. Moving on to the new requests. The remaining new requests here are what make up that $244,000 that was identified earlier. Um, I highlighted the remaining requests there. Uh, there's a, a request for a 1.0 science teacher at the high school. Um, as we saw presented earlier, uh, there's a request for a SEAL, or uh, sorry, Blue Crew Academy pilot coordinator and a SEAL of Civic Readiness coordinator. And then uh, a request for school front software to be used for onboarding community ed stipend increase, high school supplies and materials needed for the Blue Crew Academy pilot, uh, a resurfacing of the main gym floor for the athletics, and then um, some cyber security uh, packages through BOCES. Um, 
to enhance our, our cybersecurity uh, package. Any questions about any of those items? I'll just add that uh, Mr. Loria, myself, uh, Cheryl, and Bob looked at the course requests for the high school today. Uh, so we do see the need uh, to continue to advocate for the science position. Cyber security at least increasing. So um, I thought we uh, took on something new in last year's budget as well. So can we come in with yes, the grant, the grant Yeah. Um, so that in last year's budget it was to create a position for um, the debt privacy officer. Um, and so uh, This I can, is more I can jump in a little bit, and then you can help me out. Yeah. So we, we were audited by the state education department, and they identified areas of vulnerability for the district. So not only did we hire somebody to create a new position, but now we need to make sure that we are adding layers to protect us from outside attacks in the cyber world. <coughs> so I'm assuming uh, that the uh, besides this is an increasing salary or anything for people. These are tools that we can use to keep us safe against uh, ransomware attacks and phishing attacks. Correct. Yeah. So um, the so the first line there, there's through BOCES, they offer two, uh, two or three different vendors. They offer packages for detection response. There's a managed detection response, and then there's another type of detection response. So when they detect uh, hack hackers or cyber criminals, you know, trying to get into your system. It, 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 there's a service to help you respond to those attacks to deal with them to make sure your security is up to date, things like that. So, you know, I'm sure you've seen in the news the amount of cyber attacks that are just going up and up and up. And, uh, you know, the reason why this has kind of survived is to, to help us. You know, we're, we're a big district and, you know, we have a lot of dollars and that's a target for a lot of people. So this will help us use our security to try to prevent any attacks. Thank you for explaining it. So just uh, talking about the capital outlay plan briefly, um, they did try to increase this from $100,000 last year to $250,000. That did not survive last year's budget. The governor did not include that in her budget this year. The House and Assembly both uh, included that in their budgets. So um, I won't say I'm super optimistic, but it's, it's still a lot of advocacy to correct. increase. $100,000 in a district like ours doesn't an entire roof, you right. know. So this is good. It's good. Hope we hope that we get flexibility from the governor to increase it to the 250. Yes, sir. So uh, currently, our uh, capital outlay project for this year and for next year is to install access controls at Kegelbein. Um We just had the vendor in uh, last week or the week before to go through and uh, we walk the building with them look at all the doors and make sure we have the proper hardware identified for that. Um, so that'll be the plan for this year and for next year. I do, I do want to remind the board that Angelo Mornello and Sean Ryan have supported us in requests, uh, for example, with the capital, small capital outlay. So if we need to go back to them, I'm sure we will. Yes. So uh, with that being said, we did finally get confirmation of funding uh, within the last couple of weeks from the do dormitory authority of the state of New York, DESNY. That's where uh, the Sean Ryan money came in. Um, I believe that was about 115000 That money will be used to do the door hardware at Sigma. So uh, by early next year, we're hoping to have all three elementary schools completed with that uh, access control hardware. Uh, so the budget recap. Not a ton of changes here. Uh, again, the only real material change was to health care, which brought the total expenses down uh, slightly. So on the bottom of that, you'll see the, um, the budget to budget different. Without the request is about 2.7 million. And then with those requests added back in is about 
just over 2.9 Bob, on, on that line, on that, the, the revenue line has the appropriate fund balance, 6.7 million, okay, which is significantly higher than last year. Can you explain that difference and how that affects us? Yeah, so uh, that is the difference between the uh, revenue budget and the expense budget. So um, that has, that did go down uh, a little bit from the last presentation uh, because of the change in health care, but um, basically that is how you close the budget gap, you know, with the appropriate fund balance, the difference between which, which affects us how? So, you know, it would, that that would be the amount, if, if we only realize the uh, budgeted uh, revenues and then we spent everything we, we plan to spend on the expenses, that would be the amount that we'd have to take from the fund balance to... Uh, okay, so our fund balance. balance would be going down as a result of that? Correct, yes sir. I knew that. I just want to confirm. Yes, sir. <laughs> Any other questions on this slide? Uh, this graph, budget recap and fund balance on the next slide has not changed from last time. It was the same as presented on March 11th. Uh, tax cap is also the same from March 11th, as well as slide 44. Um, the bus proposition number two, I did update that budgeted amount on there to reflect 675000 um, We are uh, hoping to purchase two large 65 passenger buses this year, one 42 passenger bus with a rear lift, and then two Ford F-350 4x4s for buildings and grounds. Um, those buses, as I stated earlier, are on a 10-year replacement plan. Last it did. Okay. So the, the budgeted uh, number on the last presentation, I believe, was 775000 So it did go down by $100,000. The same amount of vehicles, right? We just had one number yes, last year. Yes, sir. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So that's why I was confused because the numbers were yeah. Thanks. Yeah. The, the 675 is slightly higher than if you added those five vehicles up, but that leaves us a little bit of room in case those prices increase, which we all know. <laughs> any other questions on the bus proposition? Do we have any um, buses that the, um, once the, it goes to auction, do you believe we're going to be profiting off of to offset any of this? Or? Yes, yes ma'am. So any, you know, once they get past that 10 years, uh, usually, you know, we, we kind of see where they're at, but, um, you know, then they do go on auctions international. We don't usually get a whole ton of money for them. Uh, the small buses, uh, we do usually get a reasonable amount back. The big buses, we only usually get a couple thousand for it. Um, you know, by the time they get to 10 years old, they've got a lot of wear and tear from weather and salt and, and things like that. So, you know, they're not, it's not a huge market for them, especially Um, any other questions on the vehicles? No, we Joy and I are just looking at the Board of Education expenses. Um, okay. um and, and we can send you an email on this, but there's there's just some expenses that you know, under miscellaneous um Niagara, Niagara Frontier Publications for seven hundred bucks. Tops markets for 800, the travel expenses. I mean, we're looking to think that maybe the location can do our part. It's not a lot of money. We're looking at our travel expenses and our miscellaneous, we could probably do our part to cut some. Um, but we need to understand what some of this is before we do a presentation. Um, I think Jim, Jim can answer a couple of things, Jim. Well, we, we can put it in an email. I, if, you know, and then. Um, yeah. Of interest of time. Yeah. And that way you guys get time to actually look at it. I'm not even going to do it. I mean, if you'd like to answer, that's fine. Yeah. If you have them, that's great. I just. Yeah. I opt for email. <laughs> Thank you. Email. Well, we have a couple yeah. of yeah
Yeah. So that was the uh, the board retreat. Legal the board retreat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the board. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I just. Yeah. If we could just. I mean. The one that Tony Day put out. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Just just some things maybe you know I mean it won't amount to much but certainly we can do our part. Absolutely. Um, so um, yeah, we'll put together an email and put it out there for everybody to see and see what we can do. All right. Thank you. Hoping much, but it'll be something. Yeah, absolutely. So then uh, we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I don't think we'll need that time of the special meeting day. I don't think we'll have enough information and time to really have much new. Um, but April 16th will be our last possible day to adopt the budget. And you just never know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't need it necessarily to take it off, but. Not uh, overly optimistic that we'll have more information at that time. If we do, we'll definitely communicate with the board via email just to share any good news that may be. Absolutely. Um, and then the public hearing on May 13th and the vote on May 21st. Any other questions, comments, concerns about the budget? I had a question about the. Um, it's about six pages from the back, the unclassified contract amount of $4,500 that was A1989-400-05. What did you say that was used for again? It was still in the budget and not used. It's in the, the packet that you handed out. Yeah, are you, are you asking about what it was used well, for in 2021? To accommodate for program-wise, but I didn't catch what programs it was allotted for? So this is, uh, <coughs> are you asking about the 23-24 um, uh, page? No, I'm asking. It's a single page. Or yeah, the 20-21. Um, nope. It's, it's a um, single page. 1989.400-05. Yeah, yeah there's, there's two pages for that. There's okay. one from the current year that says 23-24 on the top. And then I, I included one from 2021. That was the last time that that budget line was used, um, just to kind of show you the last time there. Okay. So the last time it was used, I believe it was used to cover um, some special ed contractual costs. Um, it hasn't been used in the last couple of years, so it's it's kind of a you know when, when you're doing a budget, there's certain buckets things fall into, and then sometimes they don't fall into a bucket. And that's what the miscellaneous lines typically be used for. So this can be used for things program-wise that aren't. Is yeah. it specific to special ed or any? No, that, that particular line is not. Um, I don't. It's an unclassified line, so it could really be used by, by any program. So, you know, as I said earlier, the like towards the end of the year when when certain funds get used up, we might use this to support the program. Um, you know, that, that's kind of how our budget transfers happen. So, you know, if we get to the end of the year and we say, all right, we, we're not going to need this, this this year, but, you know, we have a need over at this school for this, then you know, we'll make that budget transfer and use it for something else in the program. Okay. Thank you. special education. And is it okay if I just show a few slides in the Super Ted report? Yes. Make it quick, right? Of course. I understand completely. So as the board knows, we've been advocating with our uh, representatives from the Assembly and the Senate. Uh, I was invited to a meeting uh, at Williamsville South with other superintendents and the New York State uh, Teachers Union as well as uh, members of the Assembly and Senate and they announced their intent to do everything they can with their one house bill to raise uh, additional funding and foundation aid by 3%. Doesn't mean that that's gonna happen, but that's what they've done listening to uh, people advocating for change. Uh, 
we already heard from our student. I do want to make sure that the board understands that uh, we are looking very carefully at the opportunity to install our own solar on our roofs and, and, and some of our properties. Uh, we're going to have a presentation, uh, Bob and I, I think this week, Wednesday from uh, Montante Solar. I do want to thank John Fitzpatrick for making the introduction for us. And uh, we think there may be some incredible opportunities for our district to save in utility costs over the next 20 or 25 years. We'll know more on Wednesday. And then if we think it's worthy of uh, board uh, consideration, we will bring uh, them back to do a presentation. Ultimately, we would have to RFP this uh, for other companies to respond. But right now, we're, we're intrigued by some of the information that they're sharing with us. So we'll have more information at the next, at the next board meeting for you. I do want to make a reminder to our community that uh, we need your help in making sure that uh, people driving on our roads are not trying to pass stop school buses. This was a post on Facebook. You can see that this car on Stony Point was trying to go around the bus. The stop sign, you can see the stop sign here is out. And you can see, it's kind of hard to see, but that there's a little circle. You can see a child's foot, right? So remember Stony Point on the way to Ransom. There are dash lines, so the car could, you know, legally try to pass a, a vehicle, but this bus was had the stop arm out, and you can see that this was very dangerous. We will have those bus cameras to over the summer. So or? it wouldn't be that soon. So here's some additional information for the board. Uh, there have been some legal challenges in New York State. The appellate uh, court uh, ruled against school bus cameras. Uh, this article is March 8, 2024. Uh, there is a lobbyist, uh, Sam Coy who has been working with uh, companies that offer the cameras for the buses, for stop army cameras. I sent this article to Sam Boyd. Um, by the way, also there was another uh, class action lawsuit in Hempstead against these cameras. And uh, Sam Boyd did respond to me that there's a bill in both houses that would help create a stronger law as it relates to school bus stop army cameras. So more to come. I, I understand a lot of people in the community want this immediately, but we can't uh, do it yet until we fully understand whether or not uh, these citations and the law will hold up. So there is a New York State law around this, but Sam and his team are trying to make it a stronger law. So, so. Well, I, did, you know, I just think it's important. We talked about it. I think at the Joint School Board Town Board meeting, the school board's on board and so is the town board um, and the law and what needs to be written actually has to come from our town board not from our school board so um, I know Brian has been working with our supervisor on that and as soon as everything is confirmed and good to go our, our town board is ready to act on that right so um, the action actually has to come from our town board but as long as it has full support from us we do have this full support from them of course, nothing happens fast. We just have to wait for the dust to settle. Yeah, for sure. It's unfortunate. And local town government, you know, they, I'm sure they're concerned about some of the rulings across New York State against these cameras. Right. So, <clears throat> so there's there's a couple pieces and layers of play. But we think it's important. We're very supportive, as Sue said. And as soon as we see the law has been tightened, it'll make more economic sense to Um, just These are just uh, some slides. Uh, some of our students had an opportunity in 11th grade to go to the college fair at the Buffalo Convention Center, and we thank our school counselors for initiating that. And as the board knows, uh, two smoke shops on Grand Island uh, were, uh, have been under uh, scrutiny from uh, the Erie County Sheriff's Office. And just as a reminder for our community, uh, there was an arrest made. And it was identified that uh, cannabis was being sold to minors in our community. So we just want to continue to keep this on the radar for our community. And that's it. Sue, do you want to say anything about this? Um, no, uh, 
Well, just a little. Just um, we really have started to solidify the, uh, the plans for the fire show. We're really excited about it. We um, are going to be. We have our. Um, we did get a sponsor, Certified Auto has stepped up to be a sponsor. We are going to be looking to other local businesses for um, sponsorship, whether it be through finances or we are looking for some food donations. Um, we are going to have a hot dog stand with some stuff. So we did do sponsorship letters and stuff like that. So we are going to be looking for some community support, not only to show up and have a great time, but Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, under Board of Education report, Sue um, Gizba, we just touched on that. Did you have anything else for that? No. Okay, um, Sherry, District Wide Wellness Committee report. Do we have any updates on the vending machines? Um, so we've been diligently trying to contact Pepsi. <laughs> He doesn't seem to uh, be willing to return our call, but uh, you can share that contact with me so we will try to reach out to them. So we want to make sure that there's no current contract in place with anybody. Uh, and once we verify that, we will ask them to come to the machines and then we will come to the board with a recommendation of the new vendor and ask you guys to approve the new vendor. Awesome. I have a quick question. So does is Pepsi the vendor for both the Pepsi machines and the snack machines? Because in past, um, when I worked with vending machines, there Pepsi did the Pepsi machines, and then it was a separate vendor for our snack machines that were not one and the same. So um, to my knowledge, Pepsi does all of the machines with the exception of one. There is one machine that a different vendor is operating and uh, what we've got is there's no contract for that, for that particular machine. Uh, we found some Pepsi slash Coke contracts that date back to the 90s, early 2000s. Uh, I haven't found anything more recent uh, in regards to that. So, um, but to my knowledge, everything is, is Pepsi owned other than that one snack machine. So all the beverage machines are Pepsi, just the snack Correct. I, I don't know if there's more snack machines other than that one at the current time. I, I think there's only one, but I don't know how So are you looking to swap out Pepsi altogether so there will be no Pepsi products on? So I, I guess, um, I guess I don't understand why we can't have both, right? Like, did we, did we, did they, they did. Take a survey? They did. Survey they surveyed the kids? the kids, and the kids want healthier choices. All the kids, because um, I, I just think we should do both. Yeah, I can see healthy choices in addition. In addition, yeah, I, don't, I don't think we should do both. And if, did you share the survey results with us? Because I don't, I don't know that we can make a decision not having those results. But I can't see not having healthy and not healthy, and leaving the choices up to the children, right? Because. Um, I can't see if my son was surveyed that he would not want to have a Pepsi machine. Uh, I, if I can answer some of I that. think we need to have both. So I, I think a lot of the major concern right now is that Pepsi is just not filling machines frequently. So, so not Pepsi, Coke. I, I think yeah. we have to have a balance of yeah. healthy so, and not healthy. Yeah, we because are. We, the, we still have Casey's Cabana that has things too, right? Yeah. And these aren't available during lunch and breakfast, right? They have chips and stuff. I, I, I would defer to administration. Yeah, I, I, I just think that we can't that take are, everything out that's there not are, healthy, are, right? Like, if a kid wants to have a Coke after he's had practice for three hours, he should be able to have yeah. a Coke. Or he can grab a vitamin water if he wants, right? That we still have to give our Sales kids choices. They, right? yeah. I believe the proposed vendor would have, wouldn't necessarily be Pepsi, would be a vending company that would have a variety so of So I'm, I'm saying Pepsi could be Coke, but I think, I think our, right. our kid has, our children should yeah. be able to make choices. I, the proposed vendor at this time um, is not only a big company, they're just a vending service. Um, mm -hmm. So they would have a variety of different beverages and a variety of different We can, when he brings it, we can show what, what variety they'll bring to make sure that, you know, they have more of a choice. 
Um, but they did survey and the kids do want healthier choices and they were I, I can see where they would want healthier choices, but I think if we're going to make the change, we should we should have both and not just all healthy choices, right? Well, yeah. The wellness yeah. way we can meet and see exactly what the vendor is offering and we can obviously present it to you. Yeah, I mean, there's many vendors out there that provide a, a, a ton of choices. And we could put a, a RFP out there. Well, that's, that's kind of and you can use multiple vendors too. Correct. We, yeah, absolutely. When I worked in the hotel industry, we had multiple vendors. That so had multiple. Yeah. Part of the vending machine, part of the, the benefit from them is a lot of times you get a certain percentage back mm -hmm. that it goes back to the program. And yep. Part of it goes to the athletics yep. program. Um, so uh, we can most certainly RFP it and look for yeah. different options. And then the board can. I used to work with vending companies in the hotel industry. So you have more than one, you have lots of multiple choices. And yeah, I know the high school and the middle school teachers would come together um, and they really had worked with a specific company that they wanted. Um, but yeah, I to talk to them as well. Right now. Okay. I'm sorry, I'd just like to add there also maybe a cost differential. Like personally, when I'm working at the gym, I'm looking at the uh, healthy options, they seem to be a lot more expensive. So um, also understanding the cost cost differential, which may add to Sue's point, but if you could circulate the survey results and actually, and not only do I want to see the survey results, but I want to know how large the study was, how many people it was conducted of, and, and what the age groups were. Do we currently get profits uh, donated back to our athletics or anything like that for the vending machines, yes. and what is the rate? About I, I'm not sure. I want to say it's around 10%, but again, I haven't been able to find a contract that specifies that. And I know that's part of the issue, right? Because uh, before, when they were stocking the machines regularly, there was you know a good amount coming back to that program. But now that they're not really stocking the machines on a regular basis, not only you know is that option out there for our students and for our staff, because some of these machines are in staff uh, locations as well. But, so not only are they not getting what they need, but we're also, those programs are benefiting from you know, some of those profits. That That's not pushing James and not in the, like, you all the time anyways, those kids are really big because, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I just, I just want to make sure if we're making sure that there's, there's choices for everyone. And, and, and I agree with healthy choices. I just think that we could have unhealthy choices as well. I think there could be a balance. I mean, even in hospital waiting room, there's healthy choices and unhealthy choices, right? <laughs> if you've ever sat for hours um, in cardiac care, they're there too. So I just think we could really do it for both, especially seeing they're not, they're locked during lunchtime or breakfast time, and right, it's literally for snacks. So I think we can do a balance of both. Can we also have, oh, do you have anything else for the wellness committee? I I just know at the last meeting they updated their, we looked at updating the policy um, just to make sure that we're reflecting what it's saying. It hasn't been updated in a few years, so um, I appreciate the efforts for that um, and also adding this, all the services that Fair Island is now offering, which is a lot more when it comes to wellness, um, to make sure that's included in the policy to, to reflect how much training we're doing for the teachers and, um, and on all wellness levels, right? The social emotional as well, so I just appreciate all the efforts from the wellness committee and, Okay, I did ask that community ad be put on this agenda. It didn't get on this agenda, but I did email out the board. So if you check your email, the community ad report with the financials from the last meeting, which was, um, which was our on the date of our last board meeting. So if we could add it to April 16th, yeah, we'll add it to April 16th, so that just so that's in. <coughs> the Board of Education report agenda, but you do have the financial information from the last meeting in your email. Um, and then C here is both C's um, Board of Education candidates for your review will be voting on those in April at the meeting. And then public comment session, general items not included in this agenda, we did not. Did you guys get a chance to look at those candidates? Anybody have any questions? Do we need any more additional information on those? We will vote me. Yeah. Well, I mean, if nobody had any questions, we could vote today. We wouldn't have to postpone it. I just. I didn't get a chance. Okay.
And so, yeah, so April 16th, okay. that's just for your information. And then, yep, April 16th, we can vote on uh, candidates. And um, we'll do that at our next meeting. So, sorry about that. That brings us to public comment session, general items not included in this agenda. We did not have anyone sign up. So, we will move ahead to committee of the whole items and information for the roundtable beginning with fun. Jim. I'm all set. Sure. Jim. Um, I just wanted to, um, not at the next meeting, um, I now sent an email out to request when we ask for agenda items, but I wanted to give a heads up. I was interested in talking again about, and you know, brought this to the board's attention, or, or I brought it up before. Um, having a fund for students uh, for activities, I know that they can fundraise and things like that, but I'm just wondering if requests come in uh, for something to be covered from parents. I just wanted to add it to uh, the Board of Education discussion so that we can have an understanding of how, um, if a request comes in to cover an activity for a student, how that's taken care of, or if there's a fund where that happens, or if it's 100% fundraising. So I will be adding that um, as a discussion item and wanted to have people have time over the next few weeks to gather the information for that so that we can look at um, look at that. Um, so that's it. Have a, a wonderful break, um, March 29th to April 8th, and I hope everyone gets to enjoy the total eclipse. And that's it. Sue. I'm all set. Thank you. Joy. I'm all set. Danielle. I'm good. Mike. I'm good. Thank sure. you. This morning we sent out an email to all families, staff, uh, our secondary students, community leaders, parents of course. On the screen just before you is uh, some of the results we've already started to receive and something called thought exchange. Uh, from 7.36 a.m. to 11.30 we had 252 participants, 89 different thoughts, and 1,697 ratings. As you can see here, the number has changed from 252 to 376 participants, sharing 157 thoughts and providing 4,000 uh, ratings. And what that looks like is if any board member or community member, administrator, teacher, staff member, enters a thought, it is then rated by the community within this thought exchange. So you can see here that there were 30 ratings for this particular thought, and then you can see a lot of five-star ratings, a lot of four-star ratings. So this is the work that we will be doing together um, in May to examine all of this information. You can see there's quite a bit here, and there's some really great ideas. So we encourage our community to participate in the thought exchange and then take some time to, sp uh, to share your ratings uh, based on uh, the information that's here. And this is all anonymous. So, but again, it's representative students, community leaders, teachers, faculty, the board, administrators, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if I could have a motion to adjourn the regular board of education meeting and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any objections? No one ever objects. All in favor? Aye. Motion accepted at 10:04 p.m. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you.